Okay, so today what we're going to be looking at here is chapter 19. And in chapter 19, we're looking at variable costing and analysis. So what we're primarily concerned with in this chapter is how variable costing is similar to and different from kind of what we've seen before, but here we're going to reference this as absorption costing. Now what we'll notice is that absorption costing is what is required under US GAAP. So if we think back to what we did in 2301, absorption costing is going to feel a little bit more familiar in that regard. Now variable costing is going to look a little bit more like our contribution margin income statement and that contribution margin analysis we did in the last two chapters. So hopefully you can at least see why these similarities exist, what the big difference is, and what those implications are for different situations that a business may find themselves in. And we'll discuss all of this throughout the course of this video. Now, the very first thing that we want to look at then is how we compute what is called the unit cost or the total product cost under both absorption and variable costing. Now, if you remember which one of those two methods is required by US GAAP. So of course, what we said a moment ago is that absorption costing is the method that is actually required by US GAAP. So that is one reason companies may want to use absorption costing for internal decisions because it's the same method that they are required to use for their external reporting. So if I use the same method, I don't have to make any adjustments at the end of the period. I can keep one nice set of books. I don't have to worry about any changes between methods. So it works out really nicely. But I think toward the end of this chapter, we'll start to see a huge flaw with using absorption costing for internal decision making. So as we go through this, we'll see the first thing that we want to notice is that variable costing includes direct materials, direct labor, and you'll notice here variable overhead in that total product cost calculation. And I think this makes sense. If you remember, we talked about variable costs earlier in the semester and all throughout. And we've seen that things like direct materials and direct labor are, of course, variable, meaning that they change in direct proportion to changes in output. So if I produce one unit, whatever my cost is to produce that one unit in terms of direct materials and direct labor, say it's $5, it's $5. If I want to produce a second unit, that second unit will cost me an extra $5. So now my total cost has gone up to $10, right? This is how a variable cost works. And that is what we are concerned with under variable costing. Now you'll also notice here our variable overhead is included, but is there some of our overhead that is being excluded under the variable costing method? And I think our answer here is certainly yes. So what, just like we have variable overhead, we also have fixed overhead. So in this case, you'll notice that fixed overhead is not considered a product cost under variable costing. But when I look at absorption costing, absorption costing treats every cost associated with production as a product cost. So here we will see that direct materials and direct labor are of course, of course, going to be counted as well as the variable and now the fixed component of overhead. This will allow us to see the total cost associated with the production of this unit. Now, one more time here, absorption costing of course is required by US GAAP for external reporting purposes but can be misleading and result in poor managerial decisions on an internal focus. So when we get ready to present financial information to external parties, we must use absorption costing. That is what US GAAP tells us. But when we are making internal decisions, US GAAP does not care which methodology that we choose to implement. So long as at the end of the period, I actually end up reporting in this external fashion under absorption costing. We'll go over that conversion a little bit later in this video. Now, the good news is there are some times when the differences in these two methods are basically negligible. <clears throat> and so what we see here is in these instances, there's going to be a very, very small difference between absorption and variable costing net income. So we'll see this when fixed overhead is a very small percentage of the overall manufacturing cost. So let's say here your fixed overhead makes up only 1% of your overall manufacturing cost. In that case, even if this is entirely in the different location between the two methods, you're only off by 1%. But if your fixed overhead makes up, say, 20% 
of your total production cost, well, now you see that this is going to lead to a much larger difference between the two methods. Because once again, the only difference in these two methods is how they handle that fixed overhead. Now, you'll also see a similar type thing if your inventory levels are very low or if inventory turnover is extremely rapid. In either case, at the end of the period, there's a very small difference in where this fixed overhead has ended up because you either didn't have very much inventory to begin with or it's turning over so quickly that it's all ending up on the income statement anyway. And finally, what we'll see in one of our examples in just a little while is that as we back up, as we zoom out some and look at this over a period of several years, that the differences in many cases will reverse themselves and actually zero out over time. So that in the large picture, in the grand scheme of time, these two things will end up doing the same thing. It is just a temporary difference in terms of one year to the next year where this cost is actually going to end up. Now, here's a very good chart. I think it is very useful. This is another one of those things that I think if you want to, it might be worth taking an extra 15, 20 seconds on your exam, drawing this picture out and reminding yourself how these two different methods work. Because then when you get to the test and I give you a question, you have a very good, clear graphic on exactly what you are supposed to be doing. So here's how this works. Under absorption costing, which is our method here on the left, we will notice that everything related to production is coming in as a product cost. This includes direct materials and direct labor, variable overhead, and fixed overhead. Now, where do product costs initially go? Well, product costs initially are also called inventoriable costs which means they are part of inventory and they initially are an asset on the balance sheet. So if this is the case, if I have this product cost, then what I am seeing here is that I have this full cost sitting on the balance sheet right away, meaning it will not make it to the income statement until our inventory is actually sold. Now under variable costing, we'll see something very different. Under variable costing, the first three items are treated the same way. So your materials, labor, and variable overhead, right? in this case, your direct materials, your direct, your direct labor, and your variable overhead are all moving through as a product cost, meaning that portion is still going through to the balance sheet. But you'll notice the fixed overhead piece here is being treated as a period expense. And where do expenses go? Well, expenses, of course, go to the income statement in the period they are incurred. So in this case, the fixed overhead piece under variable costing will not initially go to the balance sheet. It will instead go immediately through to the income statement to reduce net income and eventually reduce equity as we prepare the full set of financial statements. So that is the big difference here. Under absorption costing, your fixed overhead component initially sits in inventory. Whereas under variable costing, it immediately runs through the income statement as an expense. So here's our information. If you want to take a picture of this, you know, write it down, whatever you want to do. Uh, it might help you kind of see where some things are coming from as we work through the rest of the PowerPoint. But this is some of the information that we will be using. So in this case, we will notice that we produced a total here of 60,000 units. And we'll notice that they actually gave me my direct materials and direct labor in terms of a per unit basis. So I don't need to do any calculation there. I can just see my direct materials and direct labor on a per unit basis then are $4 and $8 respectively. But what we will also notice here is that they gave me variable and fixed overhead. But this variable and fixed overhead, they did not give me on a per unit basis. Instead, they told me the total amount for each one of these types of overhead. So now we have to remember that I'm trying to figure out the product cost on a per unit basis, meaning I must, I absolutely must bring down those two numbers into a per unit basis. So in this case, my variable overhead was $180,000. We produced 60,000 units, so that gives me a $3 per unit variable fixed, or sorry, variable overhead amount. Now we'll do the same thing for my fixed overhead. In this case, we have 600 
$5,000 in fixed overhead divided by my 60,000 units, giving me a rate here of $10 per unit. Now, the last part here that we have to actually deal with is figuring out my product cost on a per unit basis. So under absorption costing, all four of these numbers, the four, the eight, the three, and the 10 are of course treated as a product cost. But under variable costing, the $4 for direct materials, the $8 for direct labor, and the $3 for variable overhead are treated as a product cost, but the $10 in fixed overhead per unit is of course being treated as a period expense, meaning it will immediately go through to the income statement as an expense. So the difference here revolves entirely between these two methods, all of the changes, all of the discrepancies that we're going to be seeing over the next 30 slides or so are going to be because of this fixed overhead being in different locations under the two methods. And that is it. If you can understand that the only difference in these two is the fixed overhead, then everything seems to make a lot more sense as we work through this. So in this case, we're going to first look at absorption costing in the case where the number of units produced equals my number of units sold. In this case, we see that we produced 60,000 units and we also sold 60,000 units. So if you wanna just write there, units produced and maybe put above that 60,000, and then put units sold and above that put 60,000. So you see that we are talking about 60,000 units in both cases. Well, here we see I have my sales of 60,000 units times $40 per unit for a total sales or sales revenue number of $2.4 million. Coming down to cost of goods sold, of course, these are the units that were actually sold. That is how we get to cost of goods sold. So we'll take the 60,000 units times the $25 product cost per unit, which we saw a couple of slides back. Remember, this is absorption costing, and under absorption costing, we did come out to that $25. Now, the next thing that we need, need to see here is that that will give me my gross margin here, my gross profit of $900,000. And then we will back out my selling and administrative expenses here, totaling out to $320,000. So it looks like we have $200,000 in fixed selling and administrative. And then we have a $2 charge on each unit that is variable. So we take the fixed component of 200 plus the variable component here of 120. And that gives me this $320,000. Now the very last thing we have to do then is come in subtracting my gross margin from, I'm sorry, subtracting Gross margin by selling an administrative. So 900 minus 320, of course, will give me 580 in net income. So you're going to want to box that, highlight it, do something to make very clear in your notes that this is the number we are really concerned about in this case. It is this 580,000 so that we can see how this compares to variable costing in this same situation. So our first situation that we will be looking at then is when units produced equals the number of units sold. But as we come through here, of course, we'll look at when units produced exceeds units sold, and then when units produced is less than units sold. So in this first case, though, we are looking at units produced, in this case, 60,000, being equivalent to the number of units sold, in this case, 60,000. So we're able to very clearly see this coming through. Now, under our next method, we will be looking at this with variable costing. So with the variable costing, what we see then is that I still have the same amount of sales. So of course, that won't change between the two methods. All I am changing is how I'm allocating my cost, where these things are coming out in the process. So it makes sense to me that my sales number, my revenue will be the same. Now, what might be different is how some of these expenses pull in. So we'll notice right away, you don't see cost of goods sold anywhere on your variable costing income statement. And that is because of course, this is very similar to the contribution margin income statement that we worked in the last chapter where we start with sales minus our variable cost to get contribution margin, well then back out those fixed costs and come down to net income. So there's not really a spot here for cost of goods sold, meaning you will only see cost of goods sold. You will only see gross profit or gross margin under that absorption costing method because those terms just don't apply when we're talking about variable costing. So very good. Now we'll come down the rest of the way here 
And what we will notice then is my variable production costs are my 60,000 units. So this has not changed, but what has changed is my product cost on a per unit basis. So we will remember whenever we went back, I believe it was slide four or five, and we actually calculated those product costs, what we saw was that for absorption costing, the product cost per unit was, was $25. But for variable costing, it was only 15. So in this case, we will be using the 15 times the 60, and that will give me $900,000 in variable production costs. Now we will have my variable selling and admin for the 60,000 units times $2 a piece for a total of 120. 900 plus 120, of course, is 1 million and $20,000. Now, at this point, we need to come in. We will simply subtract the $2.4 million in sales by the $1 million $20,000 in variable expenses, which will, of course, then give me my contribution margin here of $1,380,000. Now we've dealt with the variable piece of our cost structure. We now need to look at the fixed piece. So in this case, we know that we have $600,000 in fixed overhead and $200,000 in fixed selling and admin. So that's an extra $800,000. Bringing that income down to a number I believe we've seen before, this $580,000. So very important takeaway here. This is what you need to understand for your test. You need to understand how these two income statements, of course, are set up. But the big thing, the big end picture that I need you to understand is that if units produced equal units sold, then your net income will be the same under absorption costing, which is required by US GAAP for external reporting, and under variable costing, which we can use internally, but we absolutely cannot use for external reporting. So in this case then, what we saw was that situation coming in. And that makes sense to me that that would give me the same answer because if units produced equals units sold, then that means that in the end, everything was sold. So under absorption costing, while it may have started on the balance sheet, everything eventually moved through to cost of goods sold on the income statement, reducing net income. While under variable costing, that fixed component of your overhead will be coming out regardless of how many units were sold. So in this case, you ended up with the same amount of total expense over on your income statement. So we'll go ahead and clear off these drawings and then we will go to the next slide. So for our next slide then, what we will notice is exactly what we said. In both cases, there is zero ending inventory left at the end of the period. And under absorption cost, and cost of goods sold is equal to 1.5 million. And of course, we don't see that same term for variable costing, but we will see that my total expenses end up being $1.5 million. So this works out very nicely. Now, in the next case, we're going to look at when units produced exceed units sold. And I think anytime I give you a situation like this where units produced exceed units sold, I want you to think in terms of absorption. So absorption will go the same direction. If units produced are greater than units sold, then net income under absorption will be greater than net income under variable. And we'll see that here. So going through then, we'll get our highlighter back. So in both cases, you will notice that the sales number of 1.6 million in this case is the same. So what that tells me then is in this case, the number of units produced Right, so my number of units produced, this is my 40,000. While my number of units sold, oops, I'm sorry, I got, I wrote that down backwards. In this case, my number of units produced is equal to, of course, my $60,000. And my number of units sold in this case is $40,000. So, is my number of units produced in this case greater than my number of units sold? Well, of course it is. So that tells me that this is the situation we are looking at. So in this case, my sales of 40,000 units times my sales price of $40 will give me a total then of 1.6 million in both cases. Now, the next thing that we have to look at is my cost of goods sold under absorption. So under absorption, I will take my 40,000 units that were actually sold, right? So these actual units that were sold 
times that product cost of $25 per unit. This gives me a total for cost of goods sold then of $1 million, coming down to gross margin of $600,000. Now, we then need to back out my selling general and admin. You'll notice the fixed component of 200 has not changed because once again, it is fixed. But your variable component has changed. So here we, we sold 40,000 units, once again, times the $2 variable cost per unit gives me a total here for $280,000 for selling an admin, coming down to net income of 320. Now, on the other side, I'm looking at my variable costing income statement. So in this case, we sold the still the same 40,000 units times $40 for 1.6 million. But now my variable production costs are my 40,000 units that were actually sold times the $15 in product cost per unit for a total of $600,000. We'll then come down, look at my variable selling and admin. So 40,000 times two is 80,000. 600 plus 80 is 680. 1 million six minus 680 is 920. And that is my contribution margin. So the same thing we've seen for several chapters now, contribution margin will be equal to sales minus those variable costs. Now you'll notice here, we are still backing out the full amount of fixed overhead, the full amount of fixed selling and admin for a total of 800. 920 minus 800 comes down to 120. So now the big question is, all right, the big important question is why do these two numbers not match? So why then do I see an increase here or extra income under absorption costing of $200,000? So let's think here, what is the difference in the number of units produced and the number of units sold in this case? Well, in this case, we produced 60,000 units, but I sold 40,000 units. So what that tells me then is there is a difference in these two areas of 20,000 units. And you say, well, that's great, but we're off by $200,000. How does 20,000 units equal $200,000? You say, I don't see it. What is going on here? And the answer, of course, harkens all the way back to either slide four or five, where we first did that analysis of our costs. And we did that graphic. And we showed that at the end of the day, $10 per unit was made up of fixed overhead. So in this case, we're taking the 20,000 unit difference times the $10 in fixed overhead per unit. And that will give me the difference in allocation of 200 thousand units. So that's what we see here. So let's think this through then. Under variable costing, that 200,000 extra dollars, of course, is sitting in this number here for fixed overhead. We're taking the full amount out, meaning that it is actually right now bringing down your net income. So that is what we see here. That is why your variable costing income is lower is because you are taking the full amount of fixed costs right away. But under, under your absorption costing method, that $200,000 can't just disappear. So where is it? That is the question. Where is this $200,000 extra dollars? So I'll give you a second to think about it. So in this case, and the extra $200,000 under absorption costing, I think we will see, must be in ending inventory on the balance sheet. And that is because initially under absorption costing, all product costs or everything that is treated as a product cost under absorption includes direct materials, direct labor, variable overhead, and fixed overhead. So that fixed overhead for those 20,000 extra units is tied up in inventory on the balance sheet right now. So. That is what we see in this case. And we'll kind of walk through this over the next two or three slides um, and just see that this is exactly what we expected. So in this case, my income under absorption was 320. My income under variable, of course, was 120. And now when I look at my actual comparison, we will see exactly what was expected. Under absorption costing, so let me grab the highlighter one more time. Under absorption costing, the key here is that my ending finished goods inventory is at 500,000. While under my variable costing method, my ending finished goods inventory is only 300,000. And if you look, my cost of goods sold under absorption costing is $1 million. But my total expenses under variable costing is 1.2. 
That extra 200,000, of course, is made up of the 20,000 units times the $10 in fixed overhead per unit. That is immediately expensed under variable costing, but that expense is deferred and treated as an asset initially under absorption costing. So that is what is happening in this case, and it explains why we see the end results that we actually see here. Now, for our next situation, we will look at when units produced, in this case, we produced, let me grab some text here. In this case, we produced 60,000 units. And we actually sold, in this case, I believe 80,000 units. So this is what we see in this case. Units produced are less than the number of units sold. So let's make sure that this works. So is 60,000 less than 80,000? I think it is. So what that tells me then, remember, we always want to think in terms of absorption costing. So if units produced is less than units sold, then absorption costing that income will be less than variable costing that income. So let's see how this works in this case. Initially, we come in, I've got my sales, of course. Here we've sold the 80,000 times the $40. So in both cases, we see that we have a revenue of $3,200,000. Now, the difference here starts right away with cost of goods sold under absorption. Here, we have the 80,000 units that got sold times that $25 product cost, resulting in $2 million coming out for cost of goods sold, giving me gross margin of $1,200,000. Now we'll back out my fixed and variable selling and admin for 360, coming down to net income of 840,000. So this is the first case on this side. Now, on the other side, what we need to look at is how this might be different. So of course, sales is the same. But here, my variable production cost will be the 80,000 units, once again, that were actually sold, times the $15 product cost per unit for a total of 1.2 million. Now, the variable selling and admin was 160 here, 80,000 times $2 for a total of 1,360,000. 1,360,000 subtracted from 3.2 million is 1,840,000 in contribution margin. Now, we'll back out my fixed overhead of 600, my fixed selling and admin of 200, giving me 800 in fixed expenses and net income of $1,040,000. So we now need to be able to explain why these two numbers are not the same. So here's what's happening. In the first example, or rather the second example that we looked at, we saw that I actually produced more than I sold. And what that did was under my absorption costing, it parked some of that additional fixed cost on the balance sheet and inventory at the end of the period. So in the next period, when I did not produce as much, but I now sold everything I produced this period, plus whatever I had left in ending inventory from the previous period, I have more cost sitting on the balance sheet. So now more cost will come through in this period on the income statement, which is exactly what we are seeing, which is why your cost of goods sold here is so high. And because your cost of goods sold here is so high, that is what is pulling your net income down. Now, on the other side, we look at our variable costs and see if we can logic through it in much the same way. And I think we can, because what we'll notice is that in the previous period, even though I only sold 40,000 units, I pulled through the fixed cost associated with all 60,000 units so in that case, what we then see is that that expense was fully coming through in the previous period. There's no extra expense that needs to be taken care of this period. So you actually will see that higher net income in the subsequent period with variable costing. Now, we'll go ahead and clear this out. And we'll move on to our next slide. So just as we saw before, really the difference here is still, of course, made up of those 20,000 units 
times that $10, that explains why we are seeing what we are seeing. And once again, we'll see much the same thing that we expected. So under your under both methods in this case, right? We sold everything. So ending inventory in both cases is zero. But you'll notice that cost of goods sold under absorption is $2 million, while your total expenses under variable costing are only $1.8 million. And we've discussed where that $200,000 is coming from. So hopefully you can see that pretty clearly at this point in the video. Now, if we look over time, right, and this is one of our things, is that if we actually zoom out far enough, the difference in net income actually seems to take care of itself. So in 2017, we produced and sold the same number of units. Because of that, my income under both methods, absorption and variable, was the same, so there was no income difference. But in 2018, I produced 60,000 units. I sold 40,000 units, resulting in higher net income under absorption costing by $200,000. In 2019, I produced 60,000 units, but sold 80,000, resulting in income under absorption being less than income under variable by the same 200,000. So you'll notice over the three-year period, a couple of very important things. So the first, in total, we sold and produced the same number of units under both methods, of course. But more importantly, my income under absorption over that time period and my income under variable are actually the same. So it is a temporary difference that we are seeing here. It is not a permanent difference. It will eventually reverse itself when those inventory items actually get sold. So that is what we were seeing in this case. Now, we'll go ahead and move on to our next slide. So if we must report under absorption costing for external purposes, but I want to use variable costing for internal purposes. It makes sense that I will need to be able to convert from variable costing to absorption costing. Now, you can try to derive this on the fly on the test if you want. You certainly can. Or you can just memorize the formula here. So if you want income under absorption costing, you will start with income under variable costing. Add in your fixed overhead cost and ending inventory and subtract out your fixed overhead cost in beginning inventory. Okay. Now, of course, that must be from absorption costing because fixed overhead doesn't go to inventory under variable costing, right? It immediately goes through to the income statement as an expense. So in this case, we'll look at how this would have worked in all three situations. Well, in the first case, the units produced equal to units sold. So there was no ending inventory, there was no beginning inventory, so both methods equaled the same amount. Under 2018 though, what we saw then was my variable costing income was $120,000. But I will need to add in the $20,000 of fixed overhead cost that has been deferred in ending inventory. So it did not come through as an expense yet under absorption costing, so it will be added back, giving us income of 320. dollars and in 2019, we'll see this, but in the opposite direction. So my variable costing income was $1,040,000 minus my $200,000 and fixed overhead cost recognized from beginning inventory. And that will bring me down to absorption costing that income of eight forty. dollars Now, if it helps you to go back and actually look at these items, I strongly suggest you do so as it might help you see the way this is working. All right, here, these are the summarized numbers. We're not talking about where they came from anymore. I'm just using the numbers that we already calculated. But if you don't remember these, or if you wanna go back and see if this actually worked, that is certainly a good idea, I think. Now, here's the situation we want to think about. At the end of each period and at the beginning of the next period, we have to figure out how much production I actually need. So and we might be tempted to tell our production manager, if you generate X amount of net income, you will get X amount of bonus, right? And this sounds like it would be good, right? We're encouraging them to do a good thing. We're encouraging them to cut costs, to raise revenue, whatever it is, right? We're encouraging them to make their operation more efficient and to produce better for the company. This sounds fantastic. Well, let's see if there's maybe some some 
more shady type items that we might run into if we actually approach it in this way. So if we use absorption costing, what we will see is that when 60,000 units are produced versus when 100,000 units are, are produced, three of these items do not change. Remember, these variable items change in direct proportion to changes in production. And we assume that each unit of variable cost will, or each unit will have the same amount of variable cost incurred as the unit before it or the unit after it. Every unit takes the same amount of variable cost. Now in practice, this certainly may not be true. We may be able to get bulk order discounts. We may be able to get some type of better purchasing agreement, right? We may generate economies of scale at a certain size of production. All of that is true, but all of that is well beyond the scope of an introductory course. So we are going to leave that for the more advanced courses down the road. If you wanna talk about it in there, fantastic. But in here, we're just seeing the general theory for how this works. We'll deal with reality maybe in a later accounting course, certainly not in this one. <clears throat> so the big difference then comes down to this fixed overhead section. So you'll notice if I produce 60,000 units, my fixed overhead per unit is $10 a piece. But if I produce 100,000 units, my fixed overhead now has to be covered by 100,000 units instead of 60, meaning I can allocate this over more units. So the cost per unit will come down resulting in a lower production cost per unit. So let's see if we can think about the implication here. If I know I can only sell 60,000 units, but I go ahead and produce 100 to bring that total production cost down on a per unit basis, what else have I just brought down? So if I'm only selling 60,000, that means that only 60,000 units of product cost will be moving from the balance sheet to the income statement in cost of goods sold, meaning these extra 40,000 units are sitting on the balance sheet in inventory, meaning that extra $6 a piece in fixed overhead is now sitting on the balance sheet when it really should have been moved through to the income statement if we had just produced the right amount. So we can lead <clears throat> ourselves to making some pretty poor production decisions by incentivizing net income type bonuses using absorption costing because if I want to increase net income, I simply produce more units. It doesn't mean I actually have to sell anything. It doesn't mean I have to do a better job. It just means that I produce more. I just amped up production. So in this case, we'll notice that net income of 580 is certainly different than net income of 820. And it is because once again, there's a $6 allocation for each unit for that fixed cost under absorption costing in our right hand table. All right, so in this table over here to the right, what we are noticing then is that we are dealing with our 60,000, goodness gracious, our 40,000 extra units times the $6 in fixed overhead. This, of course, comes out to our $240,000 difference that, it, that we see here between the two methods. Hopefully that makes sense to you. You see why this is happening and you understand why this could be a problem. If I sit here and produce 100,000 units, but I know I can only sell 60, all I have done is tied up all of my resources in this inventory that is not selling. So now I don't have the cash. I don't have the ability to invest in more property, plant, and equipment. I don't have the ability to hire more people. I just have more inventory. It's not really a good thing. All right, this can lead to problems paying bills. This can lead to all types of stuff. And the issue here is I can actually make that income continue to rise by simply producing more and more. So instead of producing 100,000 units, well, what if I produced 200,000 units? Well, if we come back to our previous slide and we see that now we produced 200,000 units, this is now $3 per unit. Well, now this comes down even further to 18, reducing your cost of goods sold, inflating that income even more. Produce 600,000 units, now you're down to a dollar. You can see, you can keep swelling that income, but you're just making the situation worse. So it's not a very good idea to incentivize your production managers, your production department with bonuses tied to absorption net income. because It's very easy to manipulate by simply changing levels of production. So it's very important that you understand this 
so that you know when you are managing your company what is actually happening and so you can make make a better system for evaluation for promotion for bonuses for everything that actually reflects the work that is being done and not just an accounting quirk so in this case we will now look with variable costing so in this case what you will notice is that when we are dealing with variable costing if I produce 60,000 and sell 60,000, or if I produce 100,000 and sell 60,000, my net income is the same, 580. And that is because right away, all of that fixed overhead goes straight through to the income statement under variable costing. Meaning we can't park this over on the balance sheet as an asset in inventory until sold. So we get a much clearer picture of what is actually happening during the period with our variable costing method here. So very good. Now, moving into our next slide, we want to look at determining selling prices. So over the long term or over what is called the long run, we recognize that my sales price must exceed not just the variable piece of my cost and not just the fixed piece of my cost, but actually total cost. Over the long run, if I'm not actually selling at a profit, I will not survive. So this is something that we must consider. So many factors, of course, are influencing cost, but or are influencing price, but of course, cost is the, the perhaps most obvious. So the first step here, we need to determine the product cost per unit using absorption. We will then determine the target markup on product cost per unit. And finally, add the target markup to the product cost to actually calculate selling price. So in this case, under absorption costing, we take our $25 product cost per unit times 60%, which gives me $15. 25 plus 15 is 40. My target sales price then is $40. So this is exactly what we see. Now, when I'm actually examining my management, I'm actually determining who I'm going to promote, who I'm going to get rid of, who I'm going to give a bonus to, who I'm going to reward, then what I need to be careful of is that I'm only evaluating them on what are called controllable costs. So the issue here is if I evaluate you on something that was beyond your control, then it wouldn't have really mattered who was in that situation. The outcome would have been the same because you weren't able to influence it. It was actually just totally beyond what you had control over. So a cost then is considered controllable if we can determine or impact the amount incurred. So variable production costs, of course, will be controllable by production supervisors. So if my employees are using too many direct materials, it is up to me as the production supervisor, perhaps, to ensure that they become more efficient using those materials so there's less waste. If they're very slow, it is up to me to train them to better prepare them for their job responsibilities so they can get this done more quickly. And so that this is certainly within the purview of that production supervisor. But on the other hand, those fixed costs aren't likely determined by the actual production supervisor. What will likely happen is your production supervisor will look around and say, man, we really need three new machines. And if I really need those three new machines, then I will have to likely send, submit a request for a purchase of PP&E. That will then go up through the chain. It may get approved, it may not. But at the end of the day, upper level management can't be upset or shouldn't be upset rather with a mid-level manager because there are too many fixed costs or because they don't have enough equipment to operate at the level that we want them to because that decision is not being made at the production level. It is being made by someone higher. So then we would have to look at them if we were upset with how this was uh, with how this was actually functioning. Now, uncontrollable costs, of course, then are not within their purview or not within their influence. So, for an example here, of course, this might be something like production capacity. They're not the one determining how much production capacity we have. Now, if I look at this for service firms, we can certainly use variable costing for service, and we'll focus on variable costs useful in those managerial decisions. So. Here we need to look at one very specific area and it is what is called a special order. So in this case, we're looking at special order pricing and this may be when I have excess capacity. So say I can produce up to 100,000 units. I've only got orders for 70,000 units. So I could produce 30,000 more at the same amount of fixed cost. 
but I just don't have orders for that piece of my business yet. So if somebody comes in and offers me, say, an order for 20,000 units, but they offer it at a price lower than my total cost, should I accept the order? And the answer is maybe, right? It depends. And what does it depend on? Well, it really depends on your cost structure. If the price they offer you is greater than the variable cost of production, then by accepting the order, you will actually increase contribution margin. Sales minus variable cost is contribution margin. Then your fixed costs haven't changed. So you'll actually see an increase in that income by selling at a price lower than total cost. Now, there are some things you have to think about though if you do this. One, is this customer going to expect this lower cost or this lower sales price in the future going forward? Or do they clearly understand this is a one-time thing? So maybe you're uncertain about my company, you wanna try us out, but you're not quite sure you can afford to pay full price until you know how the quality is. So we give you a discount. We actually sell at a price less than total cost, but we tell you this is a one-time thing. So that is the first case. Now, the next case that we need to look at is, well, what if my other customers find out about this? Are they now going to want this lower price as well? They might. Am I going to lose customers if they find out I gave a better price to this other person? Perhaps. So there's certainly things in practice we will need to consider, but in here, we're just going to keep this nice and clean. If they offer you a price higher than the variable cost of production, you should accept. So once again, over the long run, our price must be able to cover all costs and provide an acceptable return. Because over the long run, Essentially, everything is fair game. Everything is variable. Now, I want to be very clear here. I'm using the term variable because I think it's something we're familiar with in day-to-day -day life, but I'm using it with a different definition in this case than I typically do in this course. So typically, when I use the term variable, I mean a cost that changes as production levels change in, di in direct proportion. And that is the definition of variable that we use 99 times out of 100. In this case, all I mean is that over the long term, everything can be changed. Not that everything changes with changes in production levels, because of course, things can still be fixed. So we could still look at making some changes to our fixed cost structure, but we wouldn't have to do it right now. Over the short run, I might be locked into a three-year rental agreement. Well, if I'm locked into that, I can't get out of it for at least that three-year period. So at the end of three years, I can reevaluate and see if I want to continue that rental or that lease agreement or whatever the case is. So over the short run, things are much more difficult to change. But over the long run, I can add production capacity. I can reduce production capacity. I can hire more managers. I can get rid of managers. I can hire more workers. I can automate more. I can do all kinds of things over the long run. Over the short run, it's a little bit more difficult. So what that means then is that when we have excess capacity, that increase in production level would increase variable production costs. And that is true, direct materials, direct labor, variable overhead, all of that's going up. But what is not changing is that fixed cost because within that relevant range, within this production capacity that we actually have, my fixed costs are incurred one time. Well, I've already incurred them, then they shouldn't be influencing my decision to make this special order work or not. So, of course, we want to keep the long run price on those existing orders, and I would like to be able to make this one time sale at the existing price. But if I can't, then anything in excess of variable cost is something I should accept. And we see this work through here. If I reject a special order, I generate no additional sales, I generate no additional costs, so I have no additional income. But if I accept the special order <clears throat> for a thousand units at a price of $22, You'll remember total cost under absorption, right, which is our actual total cost, was $22. So for 22, I'm sorry, it was $25. But here we got offered 22. So I got offered a price less than my total cost. So if I accept this, I will get $22,000 in additional sales revenue. I will then take out my incremental production cost of 1,000 units times the $15 per unit for a total here of $15,000. My variable selling and admin, 1,000 extra units at a rate of $2 a unit is 2,000 extra. So I'm generating an extra $22,000, but $17,000 in expense. So $22,000 in revenue, 
17,000 in expenses, giving me incremental income here of $5,000. Meaning if I don't accept a special order, I'm actually reducing my income effectively by $5,000 or my ending income for the period is actually $5,000 less than it could have been. Now, of course, this gets more complicated if we start running out of production capacity, right? If I don't have spare room, then this is a totally different calculation because if I've already got a bunch of orders at full selling price and I can't make more units, then I'm not going to accept this lower price because it would mean giving up a full priced order. So this is what we see. And of course, in real life, it could be much more complicated, right? I might look at this, I might have to give up a full price sale to a very small client one time, but maybe this is a very large client that's looking at buying 100,000 units on their own going forward. But now they're just wanting 1,000 units to test it. Well, now there's all kinds of additional considerations that we have to think about. So the point here in this chapter is we can make a bunch of very nice, clean rules in a classroom, and it works really beautifully. But I want you to be thinking outside of the classroom, right? I'm not having you in my class. You are not taking this class to answer questions on a test. You are taking this class to be able to leave this school and actually be able to apply these decisions in your day-to-day -day life as you are running your companies. You need to start thinking critically now so that by the time you graduate, you can actually come straight in being able to provide input, being able to think in this manner. So this is what we've seen here in chapter 19. The big difference is here between absorption and variable costing being how they deal with that fixed overhead. So if you have any questions, if you have any concerns about the course, about the upcoming exam, about anything, please, please, please let me know. Either come by my office, send me an email. I'll be happy to meet with you and try to help you get caught up. But you have to let me know if you're struggling. I have no way to know that you are behind unless you contact me. So please, please, please do that. I want to help you as why I became a professor, but I have to know that you are struggling in order to be able to help you. So we'll see you in class. Please have a good one. Thank you.